Grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A funny thing happened on the way to Nineveh, according to the story referenced in our Old Testament reading today. The passage we heard is from a larger story. It is a snippet from the four short and readable chapters of the book of Jonah. Now the character of Jonah has a reputation as a reluctant prophet, but here today we see him as a very successful prophet, a successful proclaimer of God's message, a prophet who changes hearts and minds and lives almost against his own will. In the passage we heard today from the third chapter, Jonah walks partway into that great and wicked city of Nineveh. He proclaims a one-sentence message of judgment, and lo and behold, the people of Nineveh believe and repent, and the city is saved. The reading today tells us that Joseph, Jonah went to Nineveh because the word of the Lord came to him a second time. Now, the first time the word of the Lord came to Jonah, well, there the story begins. The first time the word of the Lord came to Jonah, Jonah resisted. He rebelled and he ran, which led to a whole series of unfortunate events. For those who know the story, you'll remember that when God first called Jonah, to go to Nineveh, Jonah took the first boat out of town and went as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Whoever wrote the story of Jonah included all sorts of interesting details. So we learn, for example, that once Jonah boarded that boat in the opposite direction from Nineveh, he promptly descended into the hold of the ship and fell deeply asleep apparently quite content with his decision to hide from God. God, however, was not content with Jonah's rebellion. So God sent a terrifying storm to stir up the wind and the waves on the sea. The sailors on the ship feared for their lives. Panicked and desperate, they started to toss the cargo overboard and they cried out to their gods for help, to no avail. Finally, the sailors found Jonah asleep down in the hold of the ship. They shook him awake, and they begged him to plead to his God for help. There's a sense throughout this story that Jonah needs to wake up to God's claim on his life and also to be awakened to a new way of seeing and being in the world. But poor Jonah, once he is awakened and finds the reality on that storm-tossed ship, Jonah knows. He knows and confesses that this storm was his fault. He tells the sailors about the God he is running from, this God, he says, who created heavens and the sea and dry land. So the sailors cry to this God for help, and as the storm continues to rage, they finally, in desperation, hurl Jonah into the sea as if he were another piece of cargo. Poor Jonah. And when this happened, Jonah 1.5 says, the sea ceased from its raging and the sailors worshiped the Lord. Without even trying, Jonah, that reluctant prophet, managed to convince the mariners to fear and respect his God. I want to note at this point that Jonah is an unusual prophet and his book is unique in the canon of the Bible. Jonah is nothing like the prophets Isaiah or Jeremiah who proclaim God's truths to the leaders and the people of Israel. Jonah is nothing like Peter or Andrew or James or John who heed God's call and follow immediately. Additionally, the book of Jonah 
is not an account of history and it's not meant to be taken literally. The book of Jonah is simply a story dealing with real issues. And certainly it is a story with great meaning akin to a parable. And it is a comedy at that. We should read and we should hear the book of Jonah with all of this in mind. And as we hear the story, we might consider as well the reasons our ancestors in faith considered it important enough to include in the Bible. As I read the story of Jonah, there are two issues at stake, two issues that drove him to act as he did. The first issue relates to Jonah's understanding of God. As Jonah says in chapter four, verse two, and he quotes here from the book of Exodus, O Lord, from the beginning, I knew you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. Jonah rightly understood the nature of God. This nature, however, was deeply troublesome to Jonah. Another translation of chapter four describes God this way. I know that you are a merciful and compassionate God, very patient, full of faithful love, and willing not to destroy. So Jonah knew this about God. Jonah knew God's reputation. He knew what the Old Testament says over and over again. God is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. To which we might say amen or hallelujah. The God we worship is gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love. It sounds like good news, doesn't it? Good news, except, except for Nineveh. When it comes to the people of that wicked city of Nineveh, Jonah holds that they deserve wrath and destruction and punishment. So if Jonah's first problem is the character of God, Jonah's second problem is Nineveh. Jonah really, really, really did not like Nineveh. We might be sympathetic to Jonah here. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and Assyria was the enemy of Israel. Assyria annihilated the northern kingdom of Israel and when people heard about Assyria, they would think brutal, oppressive, dangerous. Nineveh was enemy territory then and there was no good reason that Jonah could think of to go to such a place. Nineveh was the last place on earth he thought, to be worthy of the attention of the God who created the heavens and the sea and the dry land. I mean, who wants to be sent to Al-Qaeda or Boko Haram? Who wants to go to preach in Baghdad or Kabul or Haiti or Honduras? Who wants to go to the refugee camps in Turkey or Libya or Central America? Who wants to go across party lines into the halls of power in Washington, D.C. or to the other side of town on the other side of the tracks? But here's what the story of Jonah says. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. A wideness bigger and more gracious than we can imagine. God's mercy is big enough for the undeserving. God's mercy is big enough for the unworthy. God's mercy is big enough for our enemies. God's mercy is big enough for Nineveh. Jonah knew this about God's mercy, and frankly, Jonah was offended by it. So he fled on a boat to Tarshish, and was thrown overboard into the raging sea. Still, it turns out that God's mercy is big enough, even for Jonah. So a great fish sent from God swallowed Jonah, 
and he was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Three days was long enough for Jonah to sink deeper and deeper into the mercy of God. Three days was long enough to convince Jonah to heed God's call once he was mercifully spit up out of the belly of the fish onto dry land. The book of Jonah offers a picture of God's grace and mercy as two sides of the same coin. Grace can be thought of as a gift, a gift we don't deserve. Mercy, on the other hand, is not getting what we do deserve. Jonah, this one who rebelled against God's call, doesn't die in the ocean, and that is the wideness of God's mercy. Nineveh repents and God relents from destroying the wicked city. That is the wideness of God's mercy. One of my favorite writers, Denise Levertov, once wrote a poem called To Live in the Mercy of God. She ends her poem with the image of a waterfall, with this image of vast streams of water cascading ceaselessly down down upon rocks. And this, Levertov says, is an image of God's mercy. Mercy that is generously, abundantly, ceaselessly poured out from God down, down upon our stony and resistant hearts. This idea of mercy is what the story of Jonah asks us to wrestle with. God's relentless mercy flung against our resistance. In fact, the story of Jonah is a mirror for us, asking us to consider our need for God's mercy, and asking as well that we consider the Ninevehs in our own lives. The book of Jonah asks, what places are you reluctant to go? Which people are you reluctant to meet? Where and when do you resist the possibility that God's grace and mercy can change hearts and minds and lives? In so many ways, as I've pondered this story this week, it has come to me that the story of Jonah is a parable for our times. Any time there are dividing lines between people, any time we define the world in terms of us and them, any time we see the other as suspect or the stranger as enemy, Nineveh is real. Any time we've defined a people or a place as unworthy, any time we deny the image of God in another, Nineveh is real. Nineveh is real but there is no place God will not go to accomplish the work of redemption. So the word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah, saying, get up and go to Nineveh. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity he said he would bring upon them, and God did not do it. Just as Jonah had suspected and feared all along, Nineveh 